Church, good morning. So we do have a few people awake, amen? The, the, the time change, I wondered, you know, did I need to get everybody up and do some jumping jacks this morning or some stretches or, or how that would go this morning? See, I, don't, I can't speak for everybody, but springing forward is my favorite time of the year, amen? Uh, you know, I got my green on, it's, it's about new birth, it's about new life, it's about seeing birds, building bird nests around the house, seeing rabbits running through the yard, the grass is greening up. I mean, I'd rather be outside cutting grass than be inside where it's cold. But see, that's just me. But church, wow, good morning. It's been an exciting week here at our church. We got our, our new sound stuff in, which is exciting. Amen. And uh, our, our decorators have come in this week and done some decorating for, for spring and for Easter, and they always do a great job too as well. Amen. But I pray uh, you have your Bible with you this morning. Uh, we are going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 20 through 24. Hope you got your sermon outline. It's in your bulletin. Go ahead and get that out. And while you do, just two quick announcements while you're finding all your uh, your scripture and your outline this morning. Talk to Allie this morning and Jake a little bit. They are going to meet their baby girl this week. And so praise God. And so I know this has been a, a long uh, situation with Allie and with Jake and, and the pregnancy, and we have missed them so much here at our church family. Uh, going to have the baby this week, and so I know that they are extremely excited, and we get to add a baby to our church family, praise God, amen, and so we're excited in that, and we're praying for them, and then the cookout and the dessert auction for next Sunday, church, don't forget, invite people, the weather's looking good, uh, Gordon's going to do, we got a celebrity, in Gordon, uh, that's going to auction our stuff off back there, amen? And so it's going to be a great day, but to make it successful, we need your help. And so we need you to be here and invite people, bring some desserts in, let us auction this off. All the money is going to the Annie Armstrong uh, Easter offering, and so we're looking forward to see what God does with that. So again, John chapter 17, verses 20 through 24, Austin hit on something earlier in the children's message, and him and I have kind of been correlating and some of the messages that I have been preaching on Sunday morning and some of the uh, children's topics that he has been covering as well with Children's Church. You know, it's always gratifying. It's always heartfelt when someone looks at you and they say, I'll pray for you. There's something about that. One of the first people that I met here at Cecilia Baptist was Leroy Hazlett. And when I went to visit Mr. Leroy and went into his house and spent a few minutes with him, he looked at me and he said, I have been praying for you, and I am going to continue to pray for you. And when I left that day from Leroy and Anna's house, it, it really made me think. I, I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, I was like, you know, this man has already been sending up prayers to the Father for, for me before I ever even knew Him. And I'm going to tell you, and I don't, I'm not going to say this next thing because to boast, but church, I want to let you know a little bit about my heart and a little about my staff's heart here at this church. Every Tuesday morning at 9.30, our staff meets in our office. And we pray in that room every Tuesday morning. We pray for church growth. We pray for guidance. We pray for strength. We pray for those that we haven't even met yet. We pray for each other. And we pray for you. Every single Tuesday morning, these are the things that we do. And you may not know this. You, you may not even realize this, or maybe it's something that we have forgot, but in Jesus Christ, we have someone that prays, that intercedes for us. Did you know this about Jesus? It's true. Almost 2,000 years ago, after he prayed, and he prayed for the disciples, his attention turned to us. Now, how many of you this morning have ever sat beside someone or maybe you've stood beside someone when they've lifted up prayers to God 
on your behalf. How many of you all have ever experienced that? Raise your hand. Just about every single one of us have experienced that, right? There's something powerful. There's something moving about that whole situation. So just imagine Jesus is doing the exact same thing for you and for I. Can you imagine how intimate that would be to sit beside Jesus as he prayed to the Father for you and for me? Now, normally when we pray, we, we, we do so normally with our heads, what? Our heads bowed and our eyes closed. So this morning, I'm going to read this scripture, a prayer from Jesus, and I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different this morning, okay? I'm going to ask you to bow your head, and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes as I read these words from where Jesus prayed for you and Jesus prayed for me. John chapter 17, verses 20 through 24. Bow your head, close your eyes, and just listen to these words that Jesus prayed for you. It goes like this. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Let's pray. Father, what an awesome day that it is, dear God. Lord, we get to come to your house. We get to lift up prayers. Father, we get to sing. We get to give of our gifts. And Lord, we get to fellowship and be with one another. And Lord, I pray we never overlook that blessing. And so, Father, as we come today and we, we listen to these words, Father, a prayer from you, Lord, as you called out to the Father on our behalf, dear God, because, Lord, you loved us that much. Even in an intense environment, Lord, that you knew that Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross to give his life for us, Lord, so undeserving, Father. We were still what he was thinking about and praying about. Because, God, when, when you made us, Lord, you had a plan. And, Father, Jesus knew even in his last hours, that we needed to be prayed for. We needed him to intercede for us. And Father, I know there's a lot of people here this morning that need prayer. Father, there's a lot of people here this morning. Maybe they need to come and, and they need to pray for someone else. Maybe it's their salvation. Maybe it's their life. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a family problem, a medical issue. God, I don't know, but Lord, you know each and every heart and each and every soul that's here today. Father, help us not to overlook how serious that prayer is and how serious, Lord, Father God, that you love us. So, Lord, I pray you're opening up hearts right now. You're opening up minds. You're opening up ears. And, Father, these words, they just don't fall on deaf ears, but, Father, you use them to build your kingdom. And so, God, we thank you for loving us. Use this time, Lord, to speak to us and encourage us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, some may ask this question. I, I think it's normal. Why would Jesus ever pray for me over 2,000 years ago? That's a great question, right? Why would Jesus, knowing what's coming up in his life, he know he's going to the cross, he know he's getting ready to die, what would spark Jesus to ever want to get down, bow down, and pray to the Father on our behalf? Well, if you look back a couple chapters ago in the book of John, if you go back to John chapter 14, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would what? I would told you. But I'm going there to prepare a place for who? For you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That way you may be where I am. Wow. Even a couple chapters ago, Jesus is already preparing a place for who? 
for us. Then 1 Timothy 2, 4, the Apostle Paul, he tells Timothy these words, this is good. This pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so the truth is this, Jesus wants all people to be what? To be saved through belief in Jesus, every single one of us has the opportunity to hear the gospel, to experience the gospel, and believe in the gospel. And this is where your outline and your notes begin this morning with a very simplistic statement. Are you ready? Number one, Jesus prayed for all what? For all future believers. Jesus prayed prayed for all future believers. Now many times we say these words. Are you ready? While Jesus was on the cross, we were on his what? We were on his mind. And I and I believe that because he took the sins of the world so we could be saved. But I want you to understand something real quickly this morning. You were on his mind before he ever got to the cross. Amen. Way before Jesus ever gave his life, you and I were already on his mind. Jesus came to this earth for who? He came for you and I. He was born on this earth for who? You and I. He lived on this earth for who? You and I. He became your example. He became my example. He was persecuted for you, persecuted for me. He was murdered for you. He was murdered for me. He rose again for you, and he rose again for me. His mission was for you and for me. Everything that he did in life, it was never for him. Amen? And you think about this. Just about everything we do in this life, we do it for who? For us. I want more. I want to do more. I want to gather more. I, 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 I. But everything that Jesus did in this life, when he walked in this flesh, Jesus never did it for Jesus, but Jesus did it for you. Every single thing, he did it for you. This very phrase emphasizes that Jesus prayed for every single one that would believe in him through their very word. That's what he says. Well, that word is logos. That's what this word is. It's the Greek word logos, meaning the essential word of God or Jesus Christ himself. The word that had became flesh, what did that word do? The Bible says that that word became flesh and he dwelt among who? He dwelt among us. Jesus lived with us. Jesus ate with us. Jesus worshiped with us. Jesus experienced life with us. The ups, the downs, the in-betweens. Jesus became flesh, and the Word, the Bible says, dwelt among us. Now, you may be here this morning, and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you are this individual, and, and in your mind, you're, you're thinking, well, I'll, I'll save this situation for, for later on. I'll get right with God when I'm in my 30s, my 40s, my 50s, my 70s, my 80s, my 90s, tick-tock, 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 and you just keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. I don't know why we do that. Maybe you're here right now, and you're thinking to yourself, what is this prayer for me? And I'm going to tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, you better believe it. That that prayer was for you. You may not be a believer right now. But if these words are speaking to your heart this morning, then you know there is something that is missing in your life. See, Jesus Christ prayed for all of these people. I'm getting ready to talk about it. Are you ready? Jesus prayed for the weakest and the strongest. Jesus prayed for the poor and for the rich. Jesus prayed for the diseased as well as the healthy. Jesus prayed for the widow and the widower as well as the couple. Jesus prayed for the prisoner and those that were free. Jesus prayed for the believer in the darkest of areas as well as for the believer in the limelight. He prayed for all. 
And no matter your color, no matter your nationality, no matter your financial background, no matter your lack of material possessions, no matter if you think you have everything money can buy, Jesus still prayed for you. He prayed for you. And then number two, Jesus prayed that believers be what? Be one. Jesus prayed that believers be one. Through the prayer of Jesus Christ for all believers, he makes three requests just as you and I do when we send up prayers for each other, right? When we come to this altar and there's something on our heart, something on our mind, Holy Spirit has brought us up here. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will bring you to the altar and you're confused. Amen? You don't even know why you're up here, but you know that you need to go pray. And so then you get up here and you bow down. You may be in an emotional hot mess. Lord, I don't know. But God brought you up here because there's something that you need to pray about. And then you come up here and then the requests, they just start coming, don't they? You find something to pray about for your family. You find something to pray about for your co-worker. You find something to pray about for the children that's in your church. You find something to pray about for your lost neighbor or for your person that you work with. It's funny how God works in prayer. Amen? But if we give Him the time, if we give Him the effort... So this first request, it's found here in verses 21 through 22. The word one appears three times. It appears three times in verses 21 through 22. So there's quite a bit of emphasis here by Jesus. And this one doesn't signify what many believe today is just a singular noun, but this is actually a means of a, of a whole. So why would Jesus be so concerned over our unity? <laughs> I would tell you to turn on the TV, but you might, it might scare you to death. Amen? I want to read you real quick. I, I loved, uh, uh, when I was growing up, uh, did anybody else watch Charlie Brown? I, I think, you know, if a kid of the 80s, you couldn't miss Charlie Brown. Some of you guys may, may know Charlie Brown. But in a Peanuts cartoon, Lucy demands that Linus changes the TV channels. So you know what she does? She threatens him with her fist <laughs> if he didn't. What makes you think you can walk right in here and take over, asks Linus. These five fingers, says Lucy. She said, individually, they're nothing, but when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Which channel do you want? Asks Linus. Turning away, he looks at his little fingers and he says, why can't you guys get organized like that? Right? Now, this unity, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have disagreements, right? They're, they're, we're going to have disagreements. And I'm going to tell you something. Wherever there are people, you're going to have what? You're going to have disagreements. I hear people all the time, well, I don't go to church because I can't find a perfect church. Well, guess what? They don't exist. Perfect churches don't exist. Perfect places don't exist. The only perfect place that you and I are ever going to be involved in is heaven. Amen? So wherever there's people, there's always going to be some type of disagreement. Now, it doesn't mean that one denomination has got every single point correct, but what it does mean exactly what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said, no one enters the kingdom of God unless he is born what? Born again. And this is the central theme of our unity. All religions... And all denominations may not agree on forms of baptisms. We may not agree on all forms of church polity. But I can promise you there's one central issue that must be agreed upon. And that issue means there is only one way to heaven. And that one way to heaven is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is it. So if you are at another church, if you are at another congregation, if you are at another denomination, and they look at you and they tell you, oh, listen, we believe there's multiple ways into heaven. I'm going to give you one piece of advice. Are you ready? Run. Run. Because Jesus said there's only one way, and that way is through the Father, and that's through me. Run. This unity, it's also important because the world needs to know that the Father sent Jesus. 
And if we're not preaching and sharing a message of who Jesus really is, then we become like a house divided. Now, church, if you know anything about the Bible, what does the Bible say about a house that is not stable? It says it cannot what? It cannot stand. The Bible says that a house divided, it cannot what? It cannot stand. And what's even more amazing is that when we decide to live in unity and to live as one and not as many, we finally embrace this new creation that Christ has made us into. We finally live like creatures should live, and we start to proclaim a message in our lives that Jesus is who He says He is, the Son of God who lived and died and rose again. And if you look out in our foyer when you leave today, if you look in our foyer when you leave today, you're going to find that central theme right out here written on three canvases that Carl McKinley painted this week. The central theme of who we are in Jesus Christ. He lived, he died, and he was raised to what? He was raised to life. And then number three, Jesus prayed that all believers in church, we cannot overlook this, Jesus prayed that all believers be perfected in a unified what? A unified message, and not just a message. Not just a message, but also in what? But in love as well. Now, why would Christ want us to be perfected in unity as one body? Well, let me ask you a question. How many people do you know that's unsaved? How many can you count? How many people do you know in this life right now that has never been saved, never professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior? See, Christ knew then and he knows now that if we don't come together as one body of believers, then the hope for this world continues to grow dim dimmer and dimmer each day. Christ gave us a responsibility to share his word. The Bible says in Matthew that we are great commissioned family of believers that should be going and make disciples of all what? Of all nations. The biggest issue we have though, church I'm just going to tell you, are you ready? The biggest issue that we have lies right here. It lies within the heart. For some odd reason, the emphasis of teaching, reaching, sharing, and being mission-minded has lost its steam. We have become more enamored with how we can entertain people than how we can disciple people. Amen? And if we don't get back to what we are supposed to do, how can we ever move forward? We've had two young boys saved in our church over the last two months. It wasn't about being entertained. It wasn't about the smoke shows. It wasn't about the mirrors. It wasn't about anything else. You know what it was about? It was about sharing the Word of God. That's how they got saved. They got saved because people are investing in their life. Amen? They got saved because there's been men and women teaching them the gospel of Jesus Christ ever since they could walk. And they finally got to that point in their life where they questioned enough and then they said, absolutely, I need Jesus. Why do you need Jesus? Because Jesus is the Son of God. But what did Jesus do? He came to forgive me of my sins and to give me eternal what? A life. A nine-year-old can understand the basics of Christianity. Even Jesus points out this problem in verse 23. Look at the end of this verse. He talks about it. He says it's love. See, this unity is not only connected with the message of Jesus, but it's also connected to God's love for his people. So let me ask you this. Who is to show God's love to people? Whose responsibility is it, church? Someone tell me. Is it just the preacher's? Is it just the deacons? Is it just the door greeters? Is it just the Sunday school teachers? 
Is it just the youth leaders? Is it just the children's leaders? Is it just people that serve on committees, ex-deacons, former deacons, going to be deacons? Whose responsibility is it to show God's love to people? Every single what? Unification. Do you see that? Unification. A church grows naturally when people love Jesus and when people love people. That's when you see growth. Because there's something in your life that you want to share with someone else. And to get them to see that, you want them to bring them into God's house. You want to share that excitement. You want to share that joy. Now listen, the world could come to know Jesus with a unified witness, right? We could go and tell Jesus. We, we can go and share the Bible. We can go and we can share words alone. But the only way the world can ever come to know Jesus on a personal, unified level is through witness and through love amongst all brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. In 1965, how many of you all remember 1965? I, I don't think I was yet born. But some of y'all remember in 1965, there was a little song that was released, and the words go like this. What the world needs now is love, sweet. It's the only that there's just too little of. I can tell you this morning, this song is more true than what people could have ever imagined, church. Families need more love. Children need more love. The lost need more love. The stranded and the poor need more love. The lonely and abandoned, they need more love. And we as Christians need to have more love, not only toward the lost, but we need to have more love toward each, each other. And it's amazing to me, church, listen to me. It's amazing to me how brothers and sisters in Christ can't care about each other or how we ignore each other just walking down the street. You know, and I want you to think about this. If the lost saw how we are supposed to love each other by serving, by sacrificing, by being affectionate toward one another, maybe, just maybe, more people would be getting what? More people might be getting saved. If the law saw how we are supposed to be. And then last but not least, this is Jesus' third request. Jesus prayed for all believers to reach their what? Their eternal destiny. Their eternal destiny. Now I've noticed most people want to be loved, right? All of us in some fashion, in some form, we want to be loved. Whether if that's by our family, whether if that's by our boyfriend or our girlfriend or if that's uh, whoever it is, our church family, all of us want to be what? We want to be loved. Most people will do some crazy things for love, amen? But it's natural because God has made us that way. We want to be cared for. We want to fit in. We have a desire that we want to be wanted. So see, God didn't create us to leave us or strand us. Oh, no, no, no. He created us. He saves us. And he desires to have our company. He wants your company. And Jesus doesn't just want your company for a short amount of time. But the Bible says that Jesus wants your company for what? For eternity. See, Jesus' love's not conditional, amen? His love's not conditional at all. Jesus says, I'm never going to leave you, and I'm never going to what? I'm never going to forsake you. I'm always going to love you. And Jesus knew the only way for his prayer to come to fruition, it included his death. It included his resurrection. And it included his ascension. And there was one more aspect of this prayer coming true for those he prayed for. We would have to believe. We would have to place our faith in Jesus Christ. So maybe you're here this morning. And you need to pray for somebody's salvation. How many of you all, raise your hand. How many of you all know at least one person that's lost? 
Did you know you can pray for them? Did you know you should be praying for them? Maybe there's someone that God has placed on your heart to come and pray for this morning that, that's a non-believer. Maybe it's someone that's struggling to believe. Maybe it's someone that's right on the verge of placing their faith in Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're here this morning and, and, and you're, you're not a believer. But you'd like to come and pray that God would help you believe. Maybe you need to come and pray that God remove that stumbling block that's in your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you're having heart issues that's holding you back from being unified with the Lord and with the church and you want to pray that God will help you. Maybe that's you this morning. There's a heart issue that's keeping you from loving God and if you're not loving God the right way, I can promise you, you're not going to love the church the right way the right way. The late Scottish preacher Robert Murray McShane wrote, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million of enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He's praying for me. Christ has prayed. And Christ is praying. And Christ is calling all men to come and all women and all children to come to know him as the personal Lord and Savior. The question is this morning, are you going to play your part? The question is this morning, are you going to come and are you going to pray for people? See, I believe in prayer, amen? Amen. I believe that God still answers prayer. I believe God still hears prayer. And I believe it's God's will for us that we come and we pray. Amen? Amen. Now the question is, do we want to see those prayers answered? Do we want to get serious about this? I can't imagine sitting here this morning and hearing these words of the Bible and thinking to myself, Jesus prayed for me. And it not doing something to my soul. And not doing something to my mind. And not doing something to my heart. That somebody that lived 2,000 years ago. That never even knew me at that moment in time. Loved me enough. To do what he did for me. Are we doing enough? Are we praying enough? Church, this morning, this is your invitation. This is your moment to come, to pray, to use this altar, to, re- to connect with God on whatever's going on in your life, whatever's going on in your heart. And I don't want to further it anymore. So, Billy, if you come, and you, Billy's going to lead us in music. I know God is moving this morning. I know God is touching hearts this morning. And I know that God is, is ready to hear your prayers this morning. Amen. So as we stand this morning, I'm going to encourage you, will you come? Will you pray?